how does humanity avoid a ghastly future? So specifically, one of the papers I'm talking about is actually called Understanding the Challenges of Avoiding a Ghastly Future. You know, basically, Earth is losing the ability to support complex life. We're, we've seen an, an ominous erosion of our planet's life support systems and these are exacerbated by, um, of course, by abrupt climate change, but it's also other things that humans are doing on the planet. You know, our, the human enterprise's inexorable expansion is um, trashing our ecosystem, and we need lots more people to get involved in systems thinking, you know, how all the pieces and components come together uh, so that we can... Uh, you know, try to address some of the most challenging issues that we're facing today. So um, at the end of, towards the end of the last video, I was talking about this paper. So it's open source, so you can just Google the title. And we're, we're, under, we're seeing huge biodiversity loss, clearly. Um, you know, it's not just the oceans, it's not just on the land, it's freshwater and marine environments. Uh, wetlands, there's only 15% of the original wetland area um, globally that was present 300 years ago. 75% of rivers over a thousand kilometers long no longer flow freely along their entire course. They dry up before they reach the ocean. Okay, more than two thirds of the oceans have been compromised. Live coral cover on reefs has halved in less than 200 years. Seagrass extent is decreasing 10% per decade over the last century. Kelp forests have declined by 40%. The biomass of large predatory fishes is now less than 33% of what it was last century. I thought it was uh, less than 10% for the large fish in the ocean. Okay, so we're, we have a huge problem. You know, there's 0 0.17 gigatons of living biomass of terrestrial vertebrates. That's uh, vertebrates living on the land. But of those, 59% of those are livestock. Human beings are 36% of those. If you had 59 and 36, that's 95. So that leaves 5%. Only 5% of this total biomass of terrestrial vertebrates is made up of wild mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Okay, we're undergoing the sixth mass extinction, where we define a mass extinction as the loss of three quarters of all species on the planet over a geologically short interval, generally anything less than three million years. So we've seen at least five major extinction events, the most recent being 66 million years ago with the loss of the dinosaurs and the background extinction rate has been, um, since then has been 0 0.1 extinctions per million species per year. Estimates of today's extinction rate are orders of magnitude greater than this. Um, okay, so we have ecological overshoot, the po you know, and that's because of our population size and overconsumption, right? Our human population has doubled since 1970, roughly. 7.8 billion people today um, and our consumption is way, way up, right? So if you multiply the, the population by the consumption, you get the effect on the planet. Now, this image here shows the major, major environmental change categories um, expressed as a percentage of change relative to the baseline. So, you know, Earth's surface, so the red is damaged, lost, or affected and the blue is intact, remaining unaffected. So, you know, Earth's surface, 70 to 80% has been damaged, lost, affected. You know, oceans, a little bit smaller fraction, but still way up there. And, you know, it goes through kelp forests, seagrass meadows. These are very important for sequestering carbon uh, they, because they grow so fast. I mean, nothing really grows much faster than kelp. You know, the, the terrestrial analog would be bamboo, but you know, in the oceans, kelp just grows in, you know, incredibly fast. Seagrass meadows also take up a lot of carbon. Uh, coral reefs, large fishes, right? It doesn't matter what we look at. We, if, it doesn't matter what we look at, right? We're, we're causing enormous um, ecological damage to, to our planet. 
Um, and, you know, consumption has gone way, way up. Population growth has gone way, way up. It's, you know, the plastics that we put, uh, that we produce, um, you know, throw away plastics. Um, there's also, it also talks about pandemics. Okay, the loss of biodiversity increases the chances of pandemics that fuel ever more desperate hunts for scarce resources. Okay, so we're getting more and more pandemics and there's a little, there's more discussion on that in here, I believe, a bit later on. Okay, uh, but massive ecological overshoot, overconsumption, rising human numbers, um, failed international goals and prospects for the future. Okay, so they talk about none of the biodiversity targets have been met um, for 2020 that were set at the Convention on Biological Diversity at 2010 conference. So they set all these targets 10 years ago. None of the targets were met. Okay, we fell short on all of these targets. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are also on track for failure. Okay, so we have a paradox here. There's an apparent paradox. We see high and rising average standards of living in many countries despite a mounting environmental toll. And that's coming at a great cost to the stability of humanity's medium and long-term life support system. So in other words, like we're running an ecological Ponzi scheme in which Society robs nature and future generations to pay for boosting incomes in the short term. Okay, we're full of short-term-ism. Even the World Economic Forum, which is captive of dangerous greenwashing propaganda, it now recognizes biodiversity loss as one of the top threats to the global economy. The emergence of a long-predicted pandemic is likely related to biodiversity loss. This exemplifies how that imbalance um, is degrading both human health and wealth. Three quarters of new infectious diseases resulting from human-animal interactions, environmental degradation via climate change, deforestation, intensive farming, bushmeat hunting, and, ex and, and exploding wildlife trade means that the opportunities for pathogen-transferring interactions are high. Much of the degradation is occurring in biodiversity hotspots where pathogen diversity is also highest, but where institutional capacity is weakest. This further increases the risk of pathogen release and spread. And you can see what happens with one virus, the effect on the planet. And of course, climate disruption is also discussed in here. And... Uh, you know, I'm not going to go into too many of the details here because I've talked about this a lot in all of my work. Um, and, you know, it just says here, you know, we're on track with 1.5 degrees of warming between 2030 and 2052. Today's greenhouse gas concentration greater than 500 parts per million CO2 equivalent. Um, according to the IPCC, 450 parts per million CO2 equivalent would give Earth a mere two-thirds, 66% uh, chance of not exceeding two degrees Celsius of warming. Okay, and then it starts talking about feedbacks and so on, the extreme weather. You know, it also uh, basically, nation, nations so far have, have, have nowhere, been nowhere to meeting the, the, the challenge. Um, the projected rise of Earth's temperature will be catastrophic for biodiversity and humanity okay and then it goes on and talks about the political impotent impotence okay um you know the idea that uh you know politics is just nowhere near up to addressing the threat the rise of right-wing populist leaders is associated with anti-environment agendas re seen recently for example in brazil the usa and australia Large differences in income, wealth, and consumption among people and even among countries render it difficult to make any policy global in its execution or effect. Okay, so there's all of these other factors. Um, you know, lots and lots of details. Um, so the, the, anyway, the, the change, we need to change the rules of the game. Okay, 
And they, you know, th th this paper doesn't really talk about the complexities and details of possible solutions to the human predicament. There's no shortage of evidence-based literature proposing ways to change human behavior for the benefit of all life. The, the question is less about what to do, but more about how, you know, how do we scale things up? And there's many different organizations um, that are looking at that, and I'll talk about some of them, okay? So, so the idea of this is not to, paper is not to present a fatalist perspective, but it's basically to give people a cold shower to just say, look, things are really, really bad. Okay, it's incumbent on experts in any discipline that deals with the future of the biosphere and human well-being to th toss out reticence, avoid sugarcoating the overwhelming challenges ahead, and just, just tell it like it is. This is what I've been trying to do for years. Okay, if you don't tell it like it is, that's misleading at best or negligent and potentially lethal for the human enterprise at worst. Okay, so an excellent paper. Uh, highly recommend that you have a look at it. Now, I'll just brush on a couple other related papers um, that were published, uh, you know, re either recently or in the last few years. And this paper here looks at co-extinctions, how co-extinctions annihilate planetary life during extreme environmental change. Okay, so they, this is a modeling paper where they looked at, uh, they basically looked at the global diversity change as a function of the planetary heating. And they, they looked at the, if you just look at the environmental tolerance of specific individual species, then you get a curve like this. So as the temperature rises, you get a drop in global diversity. But when you account for co-extinctions, okay, then in, instead of getting this, which we, you know, this would show maybe a lot of species are resilient, the species drop off much, much faster. You know, there's a, there's a logarithmic uh, decrease here, um, and that occurs whether you heat the planet or cool the planet. But heating the planet is worse for species extinctions than... Um, than cooling it. Species are more robust to cooling if there was planetary cooling than they are if there's planetary uh, heating. Okay, um, so there's lots of different um, scenarios here. This is heating, this is cooling is, is nowhere near as bad. Um, best case, worst case, you know, random. So they, they, they basically sim looked at, they, they, they had a, a thousand different Earths, if you like, in their simulation, a thousand different food webs, and they took the tolerance of the different species, um, and they applied the models to heat and to cool, and then they looked at the change of overall diversity, okay? So it's a modeling study, but the net result is that um, co-extinctions is a huge factor. It makes extinctions worth, worse by a factor of two. So it's not just the species that are directly affected, they're sitting in the, in the uh, food web at, at a certain trophic level, and if they go extinct, it causes a cascading chain reaction of other species going extinct also. This is a, a paper, uh, mammal diversity will take millions of years to recover from the current biodiversity crisis. So they look at the evolutionary history um, of mammals and then they have these mammals go extinct and they kind of say, okay, well, we've lost, uh, you know, the, the we, we've lost all of the evolutionary thing, um, advantages that we've gained for these mammals to evolve over, over time. So uh, this is a deforestation and world population. So they, this just looks at deforestation. So it's not just climate change, it's cutting down trees. And based on current resource consumption rates and the best estimate of technological growth rate, the study shows that we have very low probability, less than 10% in most, the most optimistic estimate to survive without facing a catastrophic collapse. And then, uh, you know, global plant extinctions I talked about, but there's all of these different websites that are listed in the paper um, that you can find. So they're all listed and, uh, you know, with the possible solutions. Thanks for listening.